And welcome to day two of the PASS Summit. Thank you for being here for my session, Query Store Best Practices. My name is Erin Stellato. I'm a principal consultant at SQL Skills. And before we get started, there's a couple of things I want to mention. First, make sure that this week you are exploring everything that PASS has to offer. I know that the format's a little different this year, but there's still a ton of great things available to you. So I hope that you are making time to do that. I'm also going to give a quick mention about session evaluations. Hopefully you're finding time to do those throughout the day after you attend sessions. That feedback is great for us as speakers and also for PASS as well. This is my yay me slide and I'm going to stay here for one second because there is a QR code. If you are doing PASS to prizes, this is the time to grab that code. So as I said, my name is Erin Salato. The most important thing besides that QR code on this slide is my email address, erin at sqlskills.com. You have plenty of time to ask questions today. And I'm gonna make a note right here that in your uh, browser, you have a panel for discussion and a panel for questions. So please make sure that you're putting questions in the question section, because that's where I'm looking. If you're throwing anything into discussion, I'm probably not gonna see it till the end. So if you can make sure to put the questions in the question tab, that would be fantastic. Also know that there's a little bit of a delay between when I'm talking about something and when you're hearing it. So if you ask a question and I don't get to it right away, it's likely just that I haven't hit a time to pause or I haven't had time to read that yet. But I do have breaks built in to take a look at that and we will have time at the end also to address any questions you have. But if you, don't think of anything until later or you have a follow-up, feel free to send me an email. You can also reach me on Twitter at Erin Stellato and uh, my blog link is going to be at the end. I've got tons of content there. And what do I do? Uh, I'm a consultant at SQL Skills. I also do training, our immersion events, and speak at conferences like Pass Summit, like SQL Bits. And here's just the, the informational slide about the SQL skills team. I like to put this uh, at the beginning of a session because sometimes I mention the other members of the team, Paul, Kimberly, Jonathan, and Tim. And I want you to know that I'm talking about real people and who they are. So again, if you're interested in learning more about SQL skills or our training, our consulting services, or you wanna hear from us through our newsletter, please check out our site, sqlskills.com. We just revamped it. I think it looks fabulous. Um, I, I love it. Uh, I don't know. It's just sometimes it's the little things, right? Especially right now that make me happy. And before I continue and before I get into the abstract, uh, my wonderful moderator, Sanjet, put in a link to GitHub. And let me bring that up actually really quick. Um, here it is. I know it's right in the middle of the screen. So if you just Google Aaron Salato GitHub, you will eventually get to probably my main page, right? Let me go there. Here. And then I have a repository for Query Store. And the one for today is this QS Best Practices Summit 2020. Eventually, this stuff will probably make its way to the past site as well. But for once, actually, this has happened now twice. This happened yesterday and today. I've got everything up there now. So if you want to grab the deck and the scripts, feel free. Okay. I have, a, I have a list, actually, because I wanted to make sure that I hit everything. The last thing I want to mention before we get started, the past Board of Elections, past. I can't even say it. Past board member elections are this week. Board of directors. My goodness, that's hard to get out on a Thursday morning. Board of directors elections happening right now. I encourage you to vote if you have not already. And I encourage you to review all the information for every single of the seven candidates. There's three spots available. Please vote when you've got time this week. Thanks. All right. Abstract for today, I'm not gonna read it to you, but the session is called Query Store Best Practices because every time I talk about Query Store, I get asked about performance. I get asked about overhead. I get asked, what do I, what is the, what should I set things to? And that's what we're gonna talk about today. And I started actually by, I'm so, I'm really big on defining things. And I thought, what do we mean when we say best practice? And so I went and I pulled the definition from Merriam-Webster. And 
basically what produces optimal results, right? What is ideal? What have we established? What do we want to adopt? And the thing is about Query Store is it's still a, a pretty new feature, right? It was released in SQL Server 2016. It was available in Azure SQL database before that, but at only four years old, it's, it's still a feature that's being developed, right? There's actually, if you were listening to the keynote yesterday, Connor and Bob announced uh, Query Store Hints, which is coming in um, next year sometime, which is gonna be fantastic. So this is a feature that's here to stay. And over time, the best practices have evolved because if you remember, when Query Store was originally delete, released, it was built, it was developed based on telemetry from Azure. And the thing about all of those petabytes of telemetry is that they maybe didn't represent every single workload that exists on premises. So when 2016 was released and people started adopting it, there were some challenges. There were still some challenges in 2017. It's I think in really excellent form in 2019. So one of the things we will talk about today, the first thing we're gonna talk about today is version and the importance of version and why. Then we're gonna talk about your workload and how that is a factor. And we're gonna wrap up with talking about the configuration, which is also a factor, including trace flags. So not just the options that you select in the UI, but also your trace flags. A quick level set. I'm hoping, I'm assuming that you are familiar with Query Store on some level, but I wanna just throw some basics out there to make sure we're all on the same page. This is my one simple slide. Remember, as I've said, this has been available since SQL Server 2016, and it's in Azure SQL Database as well. It's in all editions of SQL Server. Alan White, I know that makes you so happy. It is not an enterprise only feature, right? It's available in standard as well. This is a feature that you enable at the database level. It is not instance-wide, it is per database. So you can enable it for just one, if that's appropriate, or for many user databases. And the, the key here, which is, which is fundamental to understanding a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about, is that that query store data exists in that user database. So there are system tables that are exposed through system views uh, that, through database views that you have access to, and that is where the data resides. So if you back up your database and restore it, that query store data goes with it. And of course, the query store feature includes this ability to force plans, which is uh, something else I can talk about for hours, but we won't even get to today. So there is our level set to make sure we're on the same page. Now I wanna talk about how query store works. This is going to be fundamental to many things we talk about. So I want to make sure that we're all clear on this. So on the right side of the screen, we have our database with the tables for all the query store table. There's like eight tables or so that have all of this data in it. And I'm kind of abstracting pieces of those tables into three parts. One I call the plan store, which is plan and text information. The second I call the runtime stats store, or you could think of execution stats. So this is uh, average duration, average CPU, all of those metrics. And then the third component there is the weight stats store. So I have these kind of pulled out because there's data for all of those sitting in memory when you're running query store. So I have the data that persists on disk but before it gets there, it's gonna sit in memory. And this is an optimization piece, right? If every time you executed a query, SQL Server tried to take the plan and the text of the query and the runtime stats and write that to disk, they would flood the IO subsystem. Now, our genus might argue that wouldn't happen in pure storage. That's a whole nother discussion. But you would, you would potentially overwhelm the IO subsystem. And query store is designed to have minimal overhead. So this, data sitting in memory as an intermediate step is an optimization. Now, there are different memory clerks that hold this information. And what happens is that you execute a query, it goes through compilation and optimization, and then it executes. When it hits the compilation optimization phase, once that completes, information gets sent over to that plan store and as quickly as possible, it gets flushed to disk. So the plan and the text, pretty simple, and that gets pushed to disk. 
Once execution completes, then we get our execution statistics, our runtime stats, our wait stats pushed over in memory. And those stay there and eventually get flushed to disk asynchronously. So that's an asynchronous write that occurs. So there's a lot of moving parts here, right? We have query execution, but then we have in-memory structures, which don't think of that as in-memory OLTP. It is not. These are memory clerks. These are buffers like plan cache, security buffers, all of that, right? So we have buffers that are holding this query store information. And then sometimes synchronously, asynchronously, it gets pushed to those tables that exist in the database on disk. Okay, so that's internals of what's going on. Now, why is this important? Why does this, why is this important for version? Because there have been important optimizations related to overhead performance that have been added in recent releases. Specifically, there has been the addition of internal memory limits. Internal memory limits always existed at Azure SQL database, but they did not originally exist on premises. So there were scenarios where those memory clerks could get really, really large gigs and gigs because of the amount of data in the query store. There was a change to have transactions be smaller for those background flushes. So when that async write occurs for a while, it was a very large transaction, which can overwhelm the transaction log. And then there have also been changes to the query store cleanup mechanism. So I want to go through each of these in a little bit more detail to highlight why version is so important. And the first is that memory use. So here's what you need to understand about those memory clerks. There's a, there's a few of them. You've got one for the, the unique query. And every query uh, has a set of elements that make it unique and they are stored in this hash map in memory and there's a hash map per database and understand that the uniqueness of the query depends on the text of the query so workloads that are more ad hoc are going to have a larger hash map hash match that's query that's query execution plans hash map in memory so when I talk about an ad hoc workload, I'm thinking those that have queries with a lot of different literal values, that is often entity framework and hibernate linked to SQL, right? Not a parameterized workload, a procedure based ad hoc. In addition to the hash map for the distinct queries, we also have runtime stats being stored in memory. So if I have high volume, if I have lots of unique queries, then the hash map for the runtime stats can also be very large. And then there's some additional memory structures as well used by query store, but those two, those first two are the big ones. And as I said, initially on-prem, there were no limitations to how much memory those memory clerks could consume. This is now changed. So this is pulled from the documentation right, which there's now an internal limit to the amount of memory that query store can use. And if it starts to use too much, what it will do is it will switch query store to a read only mode so that it can manage those that data that's in memory until it can return it back to the database engine. And then it will flip back into a read write. This is a performance optimization. It's designed to prevent other performance issues such as high weights, such as memory pressure, such as locking contention. And those are very often exposed with extremely ad hoc workloads. So if we don't have these limitations in place, then the memory use used by query store can get extremely large. It has to try and catch up with that workload. Um, and it eventually leads to bigger problems where it looks like query store um, is what caused it. So this was added to ensure that the impact of query store remains minimal. So visually, if you want to envision, if you want to see what this looks like, if we take that picture we started with, and I'm just going to kind of gray out what's what we're not thinking about. We are thinking about plan store, runtime stat store, wait store, that stuff that's sitting in memory, right? This is now what we have 
limited in how much size it can and how much memory it can use. The memory limit is not documented. It is a function of how much memory is available on the server, what you have for Mac server memory, and you don't have insight into that, and I don't either, to be honest with you. So what version do we find this in? This is what's important. It's in Azure SQL database. It is in the latest cumulative update for 2019, 2017, and 2016. So CU8, which was just released last month for 2019, has this. CU22 for 2017 has this. CU15 for 2016 SP2 has this fix. This should be an indication to you of how important this query store feature is that they backported it both to 2016 and 2017. So whatever CU you're on, my recommendation, I'll tell you right now, is going to be to get to the latest CU. Now, the smaller transactions for background flushes of data. As I said, data gets flushed on a regular basis asynchronously from memory out to disk. This is a background activity. Uh, you don't really see it happening. You don't have to pay attention to it. But for very high volume workloads, again, ad hoc as well, this could take an extended period of time. So pictorially, if we go back to our image, right, this time we're talking about this information being pushed from the runtime stat store over to, and the weight stat store over to those internal tables. So this asynchronous write that we're talking about, this has been improved. Um, so it's smaller transactions so that the transaction log can manage that, the log manager can manage that better. Now, this is going to be in Azure SQL Database 2019-2017, any CU, and then it was also pulled back to 2016 SP2 CU2. Um, but again, I'm telling you, I want you on CU15, right, for 2016, but I'm letting you know where these were added. And then the third big change that we care about in terms of the version is the cleanup mechanism. So different than the asynchronous flush, here I'm talking about cleaning up the data in query store. And this can occur in a couple different scenarios. The first is when we get close to our max storage size. So when we get to about 90% of max storage, this cleanup mechanism kicks in. And what it has to do is it has to look to see, okay, what do we have for query CPU? What queries have executed recently? What is not important? And it has to do some sorting and then it has to decide what to purge and that purge is single threaded. Uh, so it takes a while. We also have cleanup that runs on a regular basis, actually it's a daily basis, based on what you have set for stale query threshold days, right? We're only keeping by default the last 30 days of data. So on a regular basis, it goes in and it says, what's older than 30 days, that's what we need to get rid of. This is faster typically than the cleanup when you hit the max storage size. So cleanup removes queries based on age, significance, and it also removes plans, runtime stats, wait stats. And in the case of where it kicks in because it's consumed 90%, that continues until it gets down to 80% of its size. So it's it wants to prevent it from going to the point where it, it fills up and then switches into a read-only state. So in terms of our picture, what does this look like? Well, here we're just talking about the database and those internal tables and this process of purging this data that runs either daily because we're just doing the regular cleanup or because we've gotten to 90% of our max and it's trying to remove that data out and get it back to 80% so that it doesn't have to switch into a read-only state. Now, where do we find this fix? It's in 2019. Again, I want you on CU8. It's in 2017 CU16, but we wanna be on 22. And it's in 2016 SP2 CU8, but we wanna be on CU15. So all of those fixes are in the latest cumulative update for each of those releases. And it's in Azure SQL DB, whatever, right? That's always latest and greatest. Now, one other thing I wanna note with regard to version is an emergency button. Um, later versions, it's one CU behind, I think for each, have the ability to forcibly disable query store. And this is huge. I ran into a problem with a customer about, 
I think it was about a year ago at this point with SQL Server 2017, where they had a query store, which was 100 gigs, which is not recommended. And so remember those internal memory structures I told you about, those memory clerks? When you restart SQL Server, Query store has to push the data into those structures. Some of that information has to be there. And it takes time to do that. It has to read it from disk and push it into memory. And they didn't have the right trace flag enabled. And while that load is occurring, there's nothing that they could do. Um, and you could, you had no ability to turn off query store at that point. For that 100 gig query store, it took 45 minutes for that to load. If that doesn't dissuade you, from having a ginormous query store, I don't know what will. Um, as a side note, you really wanna keep it 10 gigs or less. But we now do have the ability to turn it off with alter database set query store off and then the parentheses forced. So this is something that will stop everything that's happening in the background. So if it's flushing data to disk, it's gonna stop that. You are gonna lose data if that occurs. If it's in the middle of purging data, it's gonna stop that. It's basically pulling the plug on query store and turning it off forcibly. So this is again in latest CU minus one, if you're there already, you can you can turn this off. And I again, I love that they ported this back both to 2016 and 2017. Okay, now before I go talk about workload, I know there's some questions that have come in. So let me see where we are. So question from David, do I have to allow for a larger file size for my LDF when I implement query store? That's not, that's not something that I've seen as an issue. Again, it's an asynchronous flush that occurs. Um, if you think about how much data you're writing to your tables versus how much data you're writing to query store, it's really typically not significant in the grand scheme of things. Initially, when you turn query store on, you're obviously gonna start collecting data and it's going to start to fill up, but I've never seen a recommendation from Microsoft, nor have I seen a need personally to increase your log file for that. Um, Grant, there is a link for the slides already that's out on GitHub. So if you search GitHub Aaron Stilato, you should find it under my query store section. Uh, Corey says, are there any monitoring tools that you're aware of that plan to start incorporating query store into their products? No, there are not. Um, I also think that you can run a third party tool and query store. Query store offers the ability to plan for us. Query store captures a lot more query and plan information than most third party tools. I think you can run them concurrently. Uh, Naveen says, during the purge, does it impact performance? If you're not on the cumulative updates that I mentioned, it can. Yes, that's why they added those improvements in there. So you definitely want to be on the latest CU because potentially depending upon your workload, the size of your query store, that purge can potentially, potentially, it's not every single workload, but it can cause an issue. That's why I want you on the latest cumulative update. Is the plan store part synchronous? It is it is fairly synchronous. I don't wanna say that the moment that compilation and optimization ends, it immediately goes to disk, but it gets flushed way more frequently than the runtime stats and the wait stats store. Grant says, does it mean that query store stops capturing information for a time while it's being limited? Yes. So when it hits the, and I think you mean the memory limit. So if it hits the memory limit, if query store is using what it had, what SQL Server has said is the max amount of memory it can use for query store. Then when it gets there, it switches query store into a read only state. And so that means that it's not collecting anything else. It's still available, meaning if I have plans forced, they can still be, they'll still be forced, but it's in a read only state. So it's not collecting new informa information. Once it addresses that memory issue, then it will go back into a read write state. And if it flips to read only, it will give you the read only reason, uh, which matches in sys.database query store options. So you can see why it flipped. Um, that's in the KB article. And I can pull that up at the end if somebody reminds me. Um, I think I hit all those questions. Gonna grab a sip of water. Uh, Caesar says, is there any QDS specific weight types that would indicate query store is having an adverse effect on performance? One of them is QDS load. You'll see that when um, query store starts up and it's loading that data 
into memory. Um, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit later when I get to uh, trace flags. Uh, and then Long says, can data store be sent to a different database table for later use? No, you would have to do that manually. There's no automated way to take the data that's in query store and push it somewhere else. It is built into that user database. If you want it to go somewhere else, you need to um, find out, you need to create a method to do that, to extract that database on a regular basis. Scrap, extract that, ugh, extract that data um, on a regular basis. So let me just say, is there a way to back up only the query store data tables? Um, you could clone the database. And when you clone the database, by default, it takes the query store data with it. So if you clone it, you can get the schema, the stats, and all of that, but no data, but also the query store data. So that's one way to do that. Um, there was one more that I thought I saw, but I think we're good. Tom says, is the memory limit in addition to the instance limit? I don't know that I understand that question. The memory clerks that Query Store uses are within max server memory. So the memory limit that SQL Server sets for what Query Store uses is a function of both the, the memory on the machine and also max server memory. And if that didn't answer, please ask again in a different way so that I can get it right for you. Okay, now I wanna talk about workload because this is critical as well. So there are, when I'm thinking about an OLTP environment, I'm not really thinking about data warehouse, I'm thinking about an OLTP environment. There's two really sets of workloads that I tend to see most frequently. The first is a procedural based workload or a parameterize where you have queries that use parameters or you have store procedures that have um, input values, input parameters to that. And so queries run, the plan gets generated, gets pushed into the plan cache, and then that plan gets reused until it's evicted for some reason or until there's a recompile. And so that workload, that method is great in the sense that we get plan reuse. We don't have lots and lots of recompiles. There's potential issues there with a parameter sensitivity, parameter sniffing. Um, but the plan cache stays a reasonable size. So some examples of some queries here, and these aren't in procedures, but you could, but you could very easily right, create a procedure and pass in an input parameter where we're declaring a color name, we're setting a color, we're setting the variable of color name to a value, and then we're passing that into our query. Right? On the right side, we're declaring customer ID as an integer, we're setting it to a value, and then we're in our predicate, we have where customer ID equals at cust ID, right? These are, this is what I mean by a parameterized procedural type of workload. That query executes, it gets put into the plan cache as parameterized, and then that same plan gets used regardless of what input value is used. Very different than an ad hoc workload. An ad hoc workload, uh, every text, uh, the, the text for every query is different because rather than passing in a parameter, we're passing in the literal values. So where last name equals Smith, where last name equals Jones, where last name equals Anderson. So this means that every single query that gets executed is unique. Query SQL Server identifies it as a unique query. So it goes through compilation optimization for every query Every query gets a plan and all that goes into the plan cache. So we get, we have two challenges here and this is independent of query store. I cannot stress that enough. The challenges here with an ad hoc workload are we have tons of compiles. So our CPU definitely goes up and we have plan cache bloat because we have plans that are sitting in the cache that have been used one time and are never gonna be used again, but are taking up space. So whether you have query store on or not, right, completely ad hoc workloads that don't have to be ad hoc, by the way. There are ways to fix ad hoc workloads in Entity Framework and, and Hibernate and Link to SQL. There's a solution. Um, but if you, if you don't do that, then it's probably gonna cost you more money. Um, whether you're an Azure SQL database or whether you're on-prem, you're gonna need more CPUs, you're gonna need more licenses, right? Your efficiency is decreased overall. Uh, so, taking this kind of workload and then dropping it into query store 
um, actually creates a, another problem separate from the original problem that you have. But a lot of people will take that ad hoc workload and they'll throw hardware at it to try to overcome it. And it, it works to a point, but it doesn't work forever. So some examples of ad hoc queries are the same queries that I had before, but rather than having declaring a, a variable and setting that and using that in the query, we're just putting the exact text in. So where color name is blue or where color name is purple or yellow or green and customer ID, we're putting the exact value for the customer ID in three, two, eight, four, one, two, three, four, right? Seven, eight, nine, zero. These are our ad hoc queries that cause lots and lots and lots of compiles and bloat the plan cache. So there's a finite amount of space that you have for the plan cache, just like there's gonna be a finite amount of space that you're gonna to allocate to query store. And there are known issues well-documented and discussed that talk about the bloat that occurs. You can find this in DM exec cached plans. And there are plan cache memory limits that are set, excuse me, in 2008 and higher and uh, also 2005 SP2, hopefully none of you are still on either of those versions, but they really haven't changed that much, the algorithm. Uh, so I'm, I have it in a table because I can never do the math for, for the equation that I have on the screen, right? So if you've got, hopefully most of you have 64 gigs or higher, let's hope for 128, if you're on standard edition, 2014 and higher. Um, you know, then you have up to 12 gigs for the plan cache. You know, if you've got half a terabyte, you've got up to 31 gigs. If you have a, a, a highly ad hoc system, you can throw memory at it to make that plan cache bigger. But there comes a point where that doesn't work both for your workload and for query store. Because remember, I said that queries are uniquely identified in query store based on a few things. These are these few things. The text is one. So if I have all of these different queries with different literal values, then I have tons and tons, hundreds of thousands different query texts, even though the context settings might be the same, even though the object ID is zero, even though the type of query parameterization is simple, uh, and then the batch SQL handle is probably gonna be different, but maybe not. And all of these end up as unique queries within query store. And we have a limit to how much space we want query store to use in our user database. You set that limit. And as your SQL database, you cannot set it any higher than 10 gigs. On premises, you can set it to whatever you want, but that's not recommended. The max in Azure is 10, and you should look at that as a guideline for what you should set it to on-prem, no more than 10 gigs. The customer with the 100 gig, that just created all kinds of problems. And that was because it was an extremely ad hoc workload. The other thing that you control besides your workload and your max size is your query capture mode. So this is part of configuration, which I wanna talk about next. This is the third important piece. So we talked about version, we talked about workload, now I wanna talk about configuration. My settings, I've got a lot. There's a, I wanna, I wanna, I have one more slide and then we are switching to a demo because I never talk this long without a demo, friends. Like I like to show you what's going on. Query story is not enabled by default on-prem, not in 2016, not in 2017, not in 2019. It is enabled by default in Azure SQL database, including managed instance. Don't be surprised if at some point in the future, there's a shift to have query store enabled on-prem because everything that I've seen happen in Azure SQL database is getting pushed to on-premises. The memory limit is the most recent example of that. That was in Azure SQL database forever. Now we have it on-prem as well. Multiple settings related to query store. They are gonna affect what data gets collected and how it is stored. I have multiple slides after this demo that go through all of these settings that I'm gonna talk about now in the demo. But I needed to give you a change of pace and I find that looking at the settings in Management Studio is much more beneficial than me talking through more and more slides. So let's flip over here. Okay. I know I've got some questions, but I'm gonna hold those for a moment, so bear with me. 
So we're going to start with restoring our Wide World Importers database. So this is a copy of Wide World Importers that I have messed with over the years. I've added data to it just to make it a little bit more interesting in terms of uh, my demos and more fun. And once we have it uh, restored, we're going to go ahead and um, look at how you enable it. And you know, it's funny. I created this database yesterday just for, for test purposes. And I'm going to do it again. I'm totally going to go off script here, right? But we're just going to call it test two, and I'm going to create it. And when you create a database, right? By default, I said query store is not enabled. And you'll notice that underneath this, I have no query store folder. But if I expand my wide world importers database, which I just restored, I do have a query store folder. So understand that you won't see that folder until you enable query store. So when you enable it for a new database, you go into properties and then we go into the query store tab. And again, by default, it's off on-prem. And I drop this down and I switch it to read, write and all of these things pop in. And if I script this out, it's basically just saying turn query store on operation mode, read, write, read, write. It picks up the defaults, which are in model, just like everything else. So the defaults, if we really want to look at what it's setting, this is here. So we have our operation mode, read, write. We have our cleanup policy. We have our data flush interval, our interval length minutes, our max storage size, our capture mode, which I talked about, size-based cleanup, max plans for query, wait sets capture mode. It's a lot of settings. It's a lot. So let me set this here for our adventure works data, or excuse me, for our wide world importers database. And then let's take a look at these. I want to talk through these in this window. Because a lot of you will probably set these here in the UI. You're probably not going to set them through T-SQL. Although I would love for you to set them through T-SQL because then you can put it in the change control. All right, so first we have read write. So you will see, right, if there's a problem with query store and it switches to read only, you'll see that show up in here as read only. Obviously, when we turn it on, we want it to be read write. We want to capture information. Now, our data flush interval. This let me just zoom in. There we go. Now you can see everything. Data flush interval. It defaults to 15, which is minutes. This means how frequently is data being asynchronously flushed from those memory structures out to disk. 15 is the default. 15 is what Microsoft recommends. 15 is what I recommend. I've never set it to anything lower. What's the caveat here? Why, why 15? Well, if we're flushing more regularly, again, we're putting load on the transaction log. 15 works in most scenarios. The, the potential drawback here is if there's a hard failure, not a clean shutdown, but a hard failure of the server, anything that's sitting in those memory structures can be lost. So if I do a controlled shutdown, whatever's sitting in memory for query store gets flushed to disk as part of my controlled shutdown by default. But if there's a failover, if there's an issue, if, if the server just crashes, whatever's in there could be lost. So theoretically, I could lose up to 15 minutes of query store data. My next one here is my statistics collection interval, which defaults to one hour. So remember in query store, it's capturing execution statistics and wait stats for an interval of time that you control. And the default is one hour. I actually tend to drop this down to 30 minutes. What this affects is your total space. If I am collecting more intervals, smaller intervals of data, then I'm collecting more data overall. So I'm going to consume more space. And you have fixed values here for that collection interval. You can't pick a, an arbitrary number like you know 17. Uh, you only have the values here. Um, the more a granular data that you want to have, the smaller you would set that interval to. I think one day is too much. I think an hour might be okay in some places. I like starting with 30 minutes. Um, just be aware if you go below that, you're increasing the space that you're going to need. Now the next one, I'm just going right down the list. Max plans per query defaults to 200. 
it's an integer. Heaven help you if you've got more than 200 plans for a query and it's happened. It has happened before where people have, have, have had more than that and they've had to bump that up. I think 200 is a reasonable place to start until you see evidence that you need to make it higher. Then we have our max size. This is a tricky one. Somebody may have already asked what size should my query store be? I don't know. It depends on these other settings that we talked about. It talks about, we need to, you need to know about your interval. You need to know about your size-based cleanup mode, which we're gonna get to. And you need to know about your query store capture mode, which we're gonna get to. So I don't have a mathematical equation because workload is also a factor there. I will tell you that I start with two gigs. Now you see that there's one gig here. There's one gig here in 2019 and 2016 and 2017, it was hundred meg, which is way too small. So I recommend setting it up to two gig to start. You may have to bump it up higher. Part of your responsibility in enabling query store is monitoring how much space is used and seeing if you need to increase it. I have a blog post that has a query that you can put in an agent job that you run regularly to check that. And then you can send yourself an email when it gets within, let's say 70%. That's one of the biggest things when you enable query store, you've got to pay attention to. Ooh, total mess up in my drawing, that's okay. The next thing that's really a factor is this query store capture mode. You will notice that it defaults to auto in SQL Server 2019. It did default previously to all in 2016 and 2017. All is not your friend. All means capture every single query that executes. And I know some folks might think, that's great, I wanna see every query. And I'm gonna say, no, you don't. You don't wanna see queries that only execute one or two times. You don't wanna see queries that are trivial in terms of compile time or execution time. You wanna see the ones that run over and over again and the ones that are most expensive. So you're, if you have a procedure-based workload, you want auto. If you have an ad hoc workload and you're on 2016 and 2017, you can try auto. And I say try because your workload might be too much for that. You, with the memory limitations in place, you may be okay. You may go into a read write state or read only state every so often, but with an ad hoc workload, the thing that shines for you is 2019 and query store capture mode of custom. So the thing about auto is that it filters out queries that are insignificant as determined by Microsoft. And it may not filter out enough in an ad hoc workload, which is why they introduced custom. So you'll notice now when I switch to custom down here, I get all of these new options, which puts you completely in control. No excuses now, in my opinion, to not give query store a shot in 2019 latest CU ad hoc workload with a custom capture policy. Here's how this works. The first thing you wanna set, which I wish this was first in the list, is this stale threshold. That's basically the window of time against which it's gonna look at these other three metrics. And those three metrics are execution count, and then total compile CPU and total execution CPU time. So we set the limits. Let's say we're gonna stick with an hour for our threshold. Within one hour, if we have a query that doesn't execute more than 30 times, that doesn't have a total compile time of more than one second and doesn't have a total execution time of more than hundred milliseconds, we won't capture it. Now, your next question is like, hey, Aaron, what should I set these to? And I'm gonna say, Mm, not 100% sure either, but you might have some data to help you figure that out. For execution count, 30 to me seems pretty high, but, but okay, because these work in an or scenario. If it exceeds the execution count or the compile CPU or the execution CPU, then it will get captured. So the higher you bump these up, the fewer stuff is gonna go into query store. I think compile time of a second I might bump that up a little bit. Uh, execution time, I might bump that up to a second or two seconds. You might have to play with these. I would probably start a little on the high end and then work my way down. I do not have enough real world data from 2019 ad hoc workload users to give you any great guidance at this point. But if you wanna help me with that, let me know. So 
Custom would be for ad hoc. We're gonna say we're procedural, so we would leave it at auto. Then we've got our size-based cleanup mode, which is enabled by default. Do we want query store to go in and when it gets close to, when it gets to 90% of our max start to clean up? We do. If we turn that off, then when it hits the max, it switches into a read only state. So I wanna proactively clean that up. I wanna proactively have my query store sized large enough that it doesn't have to go into size-based cleanup mode, but if I need it, I want it there. It's kind of like auto grow for my files. Stale query threshold. This is going to impact how much space you need. How much data do you wanna keep? The default is 30 days. I think that's reasonable, but if you like to develop in production, you might want more. You might want 60 days. You might want 45. But I think 30 is a good place to start. That customer with the 100 gig query store with the ad hoc workload, their stale query threshold was three days. Three days worth of data was all they could keep in 100 gigs. Not recommended. Weight stats capture mode. Do you want to capture your weight statistics for your query? It's basically pulling from DM exec session weights. So it's different than what you get when you capture the actual plan and you get the weight stats in there. This consumes space in query store also. And if you're trying to conserve, maybe you're running an ad hoc workload in 2016 and 2017. You can only do auto for your capture mode. You are at 10 gigs. Maybe you need to turn off weight stats to, to give yourself some more space for your plans and your queries and your runtime stats. If you have the space, leave it on. It can be helpful when troubleshooting. So those are my settings. Those are the defaults and those are what I recommend. Now, I also have that in a blog post somewhere, right? So for a parameterized workload, here's what I would recommend. I've got this in here, right? Stale query threshold, you can set that. And I've got notes in here, right? So all of this is documented for you to continue to reference. I set interval lengths to 30, max storage size to two gigs. I set this to auto because it's a parameterized workload, size-based cleanup mode. I've got weight stats captured. So I'm gonna set this because this is what I'm saying I would do for a parameterized workload. Again, you can do this in the UI. I have it in T-SQL so that I've got my comments for you. And again, I like the idea of putting this into change control. Now we're not done with our demo yet. Now I wanna talk about performance. And I'm gonna create a performance problem on purpose. And I'm going to do that with settings that I just talked about that I don't recommend. So this is a do as I say, not as I do, because this is not for production. I even have that right here, not recommended for production. So we are going to set these to horrible values. I'm gonna set the data flush interval to 60 seconds. So it's gonna push data out every minute. No. I'm gonna set my interval length to 30, that's fine. I'm gonna set query capture mode to all. No, I'm doing that on purpose for this demo. And then I'm gonna, que I'm gonna clear out query store when I'm done. Not recommended for production either. This basically truncates all of the query store tables. It gets rid of all of your query store data, which uh, you typically don't want to do. So let's make sure I'm in the context of wide world importers here for everything I'm about to do. So this, that's my setup for my configuration. Now we're going to create some code that we're gonna to run to generate our workload. So this is a procedure called random selects. And what this is gonna do is create an ad hoc workload. It's funny that you can do this with the store procedure, but what you do is you uh, set your string, right? You declare um, uh, varkar max here as our query string. And then we set our query in that, and then we do an execute. And this actually runs it as an ad hoc query. So I have a couple different ad hoc queries in here that we're just going to loop through over and over again. And it's going to be a random string that it puts in the predicate. So it really simulates an ad hoc workload as best as possible. So let me create that within our wide world importers database. And then to contrast that, we have the exact same code, but it, this one is a stored procedure that actually runs those queries here in the stored procedure with parameterized values. So rather than concatenating a string and executing that, it's just running these within the context of the stored procedure. 
like you would see for a procedural or a parameterized type of workload. So we will create that. And those are the only two we need for the moment. So now what we're gonna do is we are going to run our ad hoc workload first, um, and then we are going to run our stored procedure workload. Actually, I'm sorry, we'll run our stored procedure workload first. So I've got perfmon going here. And what we're really gonna be interested in is we're gonna be interested in uh, CPU, which is gonna be over here. And I won't zoom in so that you can watch these change, but I wanna point out where they are. And we're gonna be interested in compilations per second. So with my um, command line queries, basically this is uh, a SQL script that calls, here, let me just open this up so you can see what it does. It just calls that stored procedure 10,000 times. So it's gonna loop through and execute those two queries 10,000 times. And I'm gonna fire up five, I think I do five, yeah, five clients that are gonna run that. That's ad hoc, I lied. I'm gonna run five, I'm gonna run 10. I'm gonna run 10, 10 command lines here that are going to create this workload. So 10 threads running that stored procedure 10,000 times each. So we should get 100,000 executions. So you can see processor time over here, right? Goes up to, we're in the 60s, 40s, 30s, done. So that was 100,000 executions that happened. I didn't time it, it's pretty fast, right? Less than a minute probably. So let's see what we have here in query store. Um, now I have a bunch of uh, system queries. These are some stat queries that were executed. And over here, right? These right here that have my object ID, these are my stored procedure queries that were executed. So we can see these ran here, um, average duration, this is microseconds, 774, 142. Okay, so my other queries in here are just uh, system queries, but I have three entries because these were parameterized queries. I have three different parameterized, it's really two main queries that were executed. Now, just for fun, let's see how many unique queries I have and unique plans I have within Query Store. It's in the mid thirties, okay? So after running that workload between my user activity and my system activity, I'm somewhere in the 30s. I'm just gonna write 30s there. Now let's look to see what my memory use is. So I'm looking at the memory clerks, DMOS memory clerks for query data store for query disk store. So my total memory use here is less than 10, less than 10 megs used. So I'm gonna write that down and I'll just hop back here again so you can see that. Right, this is in KB and then I converted it to makes. So um, here is my hash match, hash map, I did it again. Here are my runtime stats. And again, I told you there were a couple other uh, memory clerks uh, structures involved. Those are listed there as well. So to level set, we're gonna clear out all of that query store data entirely. And now we're gonna run our ad hoc workload. And the kicker about the ad hoc workload is I can't do 10 clients. I can only do two because otherwise we would go way over in terms of time. So this is two threads, each of them calling that store procedure 10,000 times. And what you notice over here is my percent processor time is a lot lower because I'm not doing as much activity, but my compilations are way higher than before. Um, if I pushed this, this takes a long time to run. So remember when I ran that store procedure, it took about a, it didn't even take a minute probably. And this is, this will take longer than a minute. We can sit here and I can talk through this, but we're gonna see that compilations are pretty steady and percent processor time is lower because I'm not pushing as many threads because I have to get through this demo in a reasonable amount of time. Now the impact of this, right? If I, and if I tried to run the 10 threads, my percent processor time would go up, my compilations would go up for sure. Now what happens in query store at this point, right? So let's look at what we have in terms of our rows. And this is where you see the significant difference, right? These are all of the ad hoc queries that are executing. And if I scroll over, you will see 
that we have different values for color name, different values for customer ID. So each one of these is a unique entry in SQL Server in Query Store. At this point, I'm still returning rows. And I called two, I called two threads that we're gonna do 10,000 each, right? So I should have something like 20, 40, 40,000 different queries in total. This is still running. I'm just going to stop it. How many rows did we get in the output here? 9,000. It's really slow to return all of that. So let's just do a count instead where I'm looking at unique query texts, query and plans. And I'm up to about 30,000. And oh, by the way, this is still running. It's not done. Right. So when this finishes, I'll have about 40,000 unique queries, unique plans in query store. And if I look at memory use here, right now I'm up to 200 megs, right? This is almost done. If I run that again, now it's up to look at, watch this one, watch runtime stats, 170, 176. This might've finished. So just for kicks, if I fire that off again, Continue to keep an eye on runtime stats and look at hash match, right? As I continue to run this workload, those are gonna continue to go up because I set it to all. So it's capturing every single query that executes and it has a hash map in memory of each unique query. And it has to keep that to see if that query runs again. And so the more unique queries I have, the more space I need in memory. It's gonna just keep going up. Now, I'm gonna stop that in the interest of time. I'm gonna close that entirely. And let's just, let's just see where memory use is at this point. We're up to about 300 megs. And before we were at 30, so a tenfold increase and I didn't even run near the same number of queries. So now we're gonna, we're gonna get rid of everything in Query Store. And then I'm gonna turn Query Store off entirely. And I want you to see what happens when I don't have Query Store enabled. First, we'll run our procedural workload. This will still drive CPU. I lied, I'm running the ad hoc workload. I lied, I'm not even sure which one I'm running. Hang on, let me fix this. There we go, stop that. This is the procedural one that I ran before. Let me run that, right? This drive CPU up to 100%. This is gonna complete again in less than a minute as it did before. So with query store enabled, without query store enabled, this workload looks pretty much the same. Now I'm gonna run these ad hoc multiple clients, but I'm only running the two like I ran before, just double checking that's what I've got. So here I'm running the two. Notice the percent processor goes a little higher, right? We were kind of in the 30s, now it's up to the 50s. Our compiles are higher too. So we definitely see a difference without Query Store. So this is why you will hear folks say, when I turn on Query Store, performance tanked. Well, it's because of your workload, right? We didn't see that with the procedural workload, we saw that with the ad hoc workload. And this will finish faster if I let it finish. It will finish faster than it did with Query Store enabled because it can push those queries through a little bit faster. It's not having to write the hash map in memory. It's not having to grab the runtime statistics because there are so many unique queries that it has to manage in Query Store. So Roland, that finished way faster than it did with Query Store enabled. Now, how do you fix that? Well, if you can address your workload, that would be great. What I really recommend is, and I have a post that talks about how to do this with Query Store, is that if you have Query Store enabled, even for a short time, or you can do this with the plan cache, is to find queries based on the query hash. Uh, the query hash is the query fingerprint, and it helps you identify queries that are exactly the same, but maybe have different literal values. If I've had cases where they parameterize just a few, like four or five of the most high volume queries, and that dramatically reduced the overhead in their system, both without query store enabled and with query store enabled. So that would really be my recommendation for how to address it. But if you can't, then the other option is SQL Server 2019. I'm going to use custom 
capture mode. So we're going to make the change to the configuration instead of using all, which is horrible. We're going to switch to a query capture mode of custom. And we're going to set our capture policy to be an execution count of five, right? These are only running one time. Compile time, one second. Execution time, one second. And by the way, I say compile time, and I really mean to say compile CPU time and execution CPU time. So we're going to set all of that for this database. And then we're going to clear out anything we might still have in query store. And now I'm going to run my store procedure workload again. So we'll start there. And we shouldn't see anything too crazy once this kicks in. What broke? Let's see. Let's make sure that I'm on the right database over here. Let me just reset everything and make sure that's good. We're in wide world importers. Here's my multiple clients. This should be 10. It is SP random selects. Let's fire that up again. There we go. All right, so we drive processor time again. This shouldn't take too long to execute, about a minute. And I know that I'm doing the same thing over and over, but this is one of those, this is one of the things you do with testing, right? Um, same thing, we're just changing one thing at a time. So once we've made that change, what do we have in Query Store? Right, we have those same three queries again, right? They did get captured in Query Store. Okay, which is expected. They ran 10,000 times. It's exactly the same thing. If we look at our unique query and plan counts again, right now it's just three. So there's some, some of those system things that were running before maybe aren't running now or maybe are not getting captured. Uh, so we'll just say three. And then if we look at memory use, this was about 30 before. And we're a little bit lower. We're under 30 here by a, just a little bit. Uh, so it was 28. Let's clear out query store data one more time. And then we're going to run our ad hoc workload one last time with our custom capture mode. So again, this is just, that's the 10 client. I have to make sure I'm not selecting the wrong one. I don't think I've had enough coffee today, friends. So we're gonna make sure we're just running those two clients as we did before. So this gets going. And percent processor time, still, still pretty low. Our compiles are a little bit higher than they were before. They were more in the 300 range. Now we're up in a, about the low 400s, 430. So this is going to roll through. And I'm going to just let this continue to go. It's still going to take a while to execute. But let's see what we have in Query Store thus far. We have nothing. It's not capturing any of those queries. I can keep running this because they're only executing one time and our threshold was five and it's not exceeding one in terms of uh, CPU duration and it's not exceeding one in terms of one second in terms of CPU compile time. And so if we check our counts, you will see that I have nothing in query store. And if I look at my memory use, we are still using memory because it still has to track the queries. It still has to create the uh, unique key in that query hash map for every single query to see has it executed more than five times or has it exceeded my threshold for compile or execution. And then it's going to start adding it. So it still has to maintain a list of what queries have executed. But it's very different than when it has to capture everything. So this is really the key. So I'm going to check what questions I have because I think I have a few. I'm going to stay in this demo. I do have a few more slides I want to go through, but I'm going to stay in this demo in case I need it to answer questions. So can you tell how large the query store is? Absolutely. If I come in and I go to the properties and I go to query store, I can see right here how much query store is available and how much is used. I can also query it directly. So if we do select, oh, let's type in a demo from sys database query store options. 
in here, I have current storage size and I have max storage size. So again, I have a blog post that has a query that looks at current storage size, compares it to max, and then if it exceeds a threshold that you sent, it'll send set, it will send you an email. So Andy says, do we lose query store data in the case of a planned failover as well? So no, if you're doing a planned, a controlled shutdown, then right, if it's a graceful shutdown, then it's gonna flush that query store data to disk and then um, fail over. Lily, um, medium transactional system. Do you have someone who did use query store on that? I need to know more information there, Lily. I'll be honest in that I don't, medium transactional system doesn't, it tells me it's that it's kind of busy, but it doesn't tell me if it's more ad hoc or procedural. So um, I don't feel like I have enough information to, to really give you a solid answer there. Um, you, feel free to send me an email if you've got a, a detailed question, I'm happy to answer it. Um, I'm not sure I'm gonna say your name right, but I'm gonna try my best. Um, Ravikaran said, would you recommend to enable query store in all on-prem databases in a production environment? I would take into account all the things we've talked about today. Are you running the latest version of SQL Server for your edition? What type of workload do you have? Those, are, that's where I would start. So um, maybe, but I would want to understand those things before I told you that that was a great thing to do. If you're on the latest version, if it's not an ad hoc workload, then I give it a shot. Um, I tend to start doing uh, the enabling incrementally. I start with my most important database and I enable that. I make sure things are good and then I enable other databases as well. Um, Chris, the custom settings are available even if you're not running 2019 compat level. Yes, Chris, they are compatibility level independent. So that's query store functionality entirely, not at all related to compat mode. So if you're on 2019, you get it. Uh, Naveen, what happens if we don't increase the max size when it reaches the threshold? When it re when it reaches 90% of the max size, then it kicks into a cleanup mode. If it gets to 100%, it will switch into a read-only state until it cleans up to get back to 80% of the max. So you want to pay attention and really try to avoid letting it hit that. If, if you can avoid having it go into size-based cleanup, because that's really not efficient, that's ideal. That's why in the beginning, you really want to pay attention to how much space is being used. Caesar says, will ad hoc queries, which SQL Server is able to parameterize, still lead to query store bloat? No. So that's a great question. So for example, if you have forced parameterization enabled, which I'm not telling you to do in any way, shape or form, there's a lot of things that you need to understand about your workload before you would do that. But if you have forced parameterization and some of those ad hoc queries are getting parameterized, then they will be parameterized both in the plan cache and in query store. Long says, how does query store work with an availability group? Just like your user tables and other system tables. So you are you have your read write copy, which is your primary. Uh, it's capturing data uh, for the queries that you're running against the read write. It is pushing that into those tables within the database. That information is getting pushed over to the secondaries just as any other data would. Now understand that your secondaries have that query store data available for you to query but if you are running queries against a read-only replica against the secondary, that is not being captured in query store. There is a feature, an enhancement request for that. Um, I'm hoping that's going to be added in the future, but that changes a lot of things in query store and definitely makes this feature uh, a little bit more complicated. Katie said the last option was that for a heavy ad hoc query. Yes, so the last thing that I did right, was I changed my capture mode, sorry, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. I changed my query capture mode to custom. So let me show you what that looks like in the UI. So let's come in here to the properties. We'll go to query store and I'm gonna look at this, right? So we changed query mode, cap, query store capture mode, excuse me, to custom and then we set I'll stop, I'll stop scrolling and moving around, right? This custom 2019, and we set this capture policy, these options, these four options, we set that in 2019 for an ad hoc workload, yes. 
Um, James said, this is a problem from Entity Framework, uh, perhaps the results of a code first approach. Um, it's, a, it's a problem because of how you can construct queries within Entity Framework, right? Um, you don't have to always parameterize them, you can, but I don't, and I don't wanna blame, I'm not trying to blame anybody, I'm telling you where I see it. Um, and it's, it's a solvable problem. Um, but if you are not leveraging some of the, the, the features and in, in functionality in SQL Server that allow you to reuse plans where it's appropriate uh, because you're using Entity Framework or and Hibernate or Linked to SQL or you're writing your own code, right? Then you can run into these inefficiencies. Um, Okay, so there's a couple of questions about uh, trace flags and there's a couple other questions, but I want to make sure that I roll through some slides. So I, I see the questions, I'm going to get to them, I promise. Um, I have, as I said, a whole bunch of times and I'm just going to zip through these, but again, I've given you the link to download everything and it's in the um, scripts as well. So all of the settings that we just talked about, I have all of the information on slides as well. I talked through all of this already. I'm not gonna bore you to death and talk through it again here. This is for your reference. I will highlight 2019, we have the custom capture mode. It's only available in 2019 in Azure SQL database. It's for those ad hoc workloads. And these are the four options that we discussed, right? And I showed you kind of how to start with setting those and that I would probably set those a little high and then start to back them down. If you have a test environment where you can push your workload through and you can test it there, then absolutely do that. I know that's not an easy thing, but trying that even with some assemblance of a workload is better than just guessing. So the default for query capture mode is now auto. It was all in 2016 and 2017. All is not recommended, even with a parameterized workload. Auto is going to ignore your infrequent queries, anything that is quote unquote insignificant. Um, and those thresholds are internally determined. You don't have the ability to control them. If you want control, use the custom capture mode. Um, queries that are part of a store procedure are always captured um, in query store, just as a side note. Um, and understand that query source still has to track those queries that are insignificant. So that um, hash map is, it can still be reasonably sized, uh, even if it's not capturing everything in an auto capture mode. And then in 2019, we've got a capture mode of custom. So you control this and it's determined by execution count, right? Do we exceed the execution count or the compile CPU or the execution CPU time? Um, you've got to set that interval and that range is one hour to seven days. I would, in the beginning, I would probably start smaller. Um, I think seven days is pretty large. I would, I would keep that at one hour to start. Again, query store still has to track uh, the queries that have executed that don't meet the thresholds. So I mentioned trace flags and I want to make sure to hit these. Um, <clears throat> in, and I talked about this in 2016 and 2017. Um, when query store starts up, it's going to try, it's going to load all of that data that it needs into memory by default. And what you will see is the QDS uh, load DB weight type. Trace flag two, excuse me, trace flag 7752 says, load that stuff, do it asynchronously, but go ahead and let my queries execute. So that means that while the query store data is loading, you can run your queries, but it's not going to capture anything in query store. So it's, it is a trade-off, but that's a decision that I think is a good one. And that's the default now in 2019. So you no longer need trace flag 7752 in SQL Server 2019. The other trace flag that is worth considering is 7745. So remember I told you that when you do a nice controlled shutdown, it's going to flush data from whatever's in memory to disk. If you're doing a controlled shutdown and it takes a couple minutes and you're fine with that, fine. But if for some reason you need to quickly fail over, potentially flushing that data to disk could delay your failover. It could be seconds, it could be longer. It depends on the size of your query store, right? I can't predict what that's gonna be for you. So if you don't want it to flush the data to disk as part of a failover, you can use 7745. 
your trade-off is that you're gonna miss whatever was still sitting in memory before the failover. So if that's a concern on your side, if you wanna make sure failovers are fast, then feel free to use 7745. That is not in there by default in any version. So in summary, I feel like I've hammered these recommendations home. I feel like you could probably guess what I'm about to say, which is first run the latest release that you have, run the latest CU. So for 2019, it is CU8. For 2017, it is CU22. For 2016, it is Service Pack U, Service Pack 2, CU15. I almost got them all out. Be on the latest and greatest. Make sure you configure your settings appropri appropriately. The two most important are here, your query capture mode and your max storage size. But there's others that we talked about that are also important, right? Your interval, um, how long you're keeping data, Got to pay attention to those. Do you want weight stats? That's going to take up space. I think you should use trace flag 7752 and 7745. You don't need 7752 in SQL 2019. And be aware of the impact of these ad hoc workloads, right? That's, that's, these are all important, right? That's why I spent over an hour just now talking about these things. So if you turn on query store and you see a degradation in performance, right? These are the things that you need to look at first. These three things that I just talked about on any version of SQL server, independent of having query store enabled, you can have performance issues because of your workload. So if you don't understand your workload, I highly recommend taking a little bit of time to figure that out. With 2016, query store makes it really easy to find those challenges. You can do it without query store, Query store just makes it ridiculously simple. Um, I've got a bunch of resources available here. Um, I wrote a new, I wrote a, a blog post that I just published this morning on query, for, query store performance overhead. I'd written it two years ago. I've updated it to include everything we talked about today. It is out there. Um, how to turn off query store. And then the last two here are um, understanding your workload. So if you don't know what your workload is like, this is, um, those are two, those posts are two good places to start. Um, as a reminder, and I'm still coming to questions, so don't go away yet. Um, and I know I'm going over, but I still have a little bit of time. Um, session evaluations, if you could please submit those, I greatly appreciate it. Um, the summit team does as well. And I'm throwing the QR code up here for past the prizes again, while I go back and answer any remaining questions. So, um, some of these are getting out of the realm of things we discussed, but I'm going to go through them anyway. Um, I'm going to stay here until they cut me off. So Sanjad will hop in and let me know, uh, or Russell will let me know when I'm done, but I'll stay as long as I can. So Caesar said, is it possible to take lessons learned in a QA, for example, forced plans, instead of having to move them to, and move them to prod, instead of suffering through the same pain? So that's a great question. You can't take a plan from one environment and push it to another and force it. You can only force a plan for a query that's generated that plan. But if you know what input parameters or you know how you were able to get that plan in QA, then hopefully you could get the plan the same way in production because QA hopefully mirrors production. So then you could run the query with those input parameters or those values, get the plan and then force it there. So David says running a full synchronous AG with query store can cause additional delays as the system waits for a response from the secondary. Well, that's independent of query store, right? If you're running in a synchronous mode, then the information gets sent over to the secondary. And if we're synchronous, it has to commit and send an acknowledgement back, right? That's independent of query store. So that happens with your user data. Yes, that would also happen with your query store. Um, so that's, that's just how it works, right? In the synchronous mode. So if I'm not understanding your question, please let me know. Um, Josh, if you want to enable, hi Josh, if you want to enable query store against a vendor supply database where you don't know if it's parameter or ad hoc, do I have any recommended settings for custom? So Josh, I would tell you to look at, I'm going to go back in my slides real quick. Um, I would tell you to look at this, um, these two bottom posts to try to understand that workload before you go and enable it. Um, but I suppose for my custom, I would set the execution count to 10. I would set uh, the compile and the execution CPU times to maybe five seconds each and see where that takes you. 
You can also try and hit DM exec query stats, right? Which is the, the plan cache. You can try and hit the execution stats in, in memory, in cache, to see if you can figure out how long those queries are taking to execute to see if that helps you set one of those values. Uh, Yuri says, is it still necessary to use trace flag 7752 even with the latest CU in 2017? Yes, to my knowledge, they have not ported that back. Um, Naveen says, is there a limit to force query plans in the query store? I don't quite understand that question, Naveen. Um, so maybe if you could word it a different way. Mark says, how do we find the query store query ID for a specific query that's been recently executed? Um, so I tend to go into, I don't know that I have anything in this database. Let me see what's in this one. You have to go into, I don't have this set up properly really to give you a good example. So hang on one second. Um, This is not what I would recommend. Uh, I'll run my workload. I will run that and I will run that. And within Wide World Importers, go into Query Store, go into Top Resource Consuming Queries. I tend to switch into the grid view. And then here is the query ID uh, over on the left side of the screen for your query. You may have to change your metric to find that query. Uh, sometimes you have to go into the tables and you have to query for the exact text and find the query ID that way. Um, can I please list the main DM views for query store? I can show you the query that's got those for sure. So there's query store query, there's query store query text, there's query store plan, and there's query store runtime stats. These are the four main views uh, that are underpinned by tables that um, have the query store data. There's also one for context settings. There's also the one for weight stats, uh, but those are the four that I spend the most amount of time in. Um, Long, thank you for your feedback. Um, that is, is really great and makes my day. So thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Okay. I am, I have eight minutes until the next thing. I am waiting to see if we have any more questions. I think I've hit everything that's in there. I know that y'all, it's easy when you're online to just kind of keep going, right? But because I'm thinking you don't, you don't have to like go to another room, but you know what? You might need a bio break. You might need to go get some Oreos or some water or maybe some lunch before whatever's next. So I will be respectful of that. And I will stop uh, chattering and hop back here to just simply say thank you for attending today. Thank you for being here at the past summit. Thanks for coming to my session. Again, if you have questions that didn't get answered today or if I didn't understand your question, please feel free to send me an email. Aaron at sqlskills.com. And again, please make sure to fill out your evaluation forms. I tweak every session before I ever give it every single time without fail. I was up until 11 last night working on this one. So feedback is great. It really helps me. It really helps pass. And please remember to vote in the board of direction board. I can't get it right in the board of directors election. Um, thank you so much. Have a great day.